Hello, welcome to round two of my gimbal review-a-thon. Yesterday I reviewed the Moza Air gimbal. Today I'm gonna to review the Nebula 5100 Slant. So the main selling point of the Nebula 5100 Slant is this slanted design with the motor angled at 45 degrees. So you're supposed to be able to see the screen of your camera easily while you're shooting if you're holding it directly like this while you're filming. In most of the three axis gimbals, this rear motor is angled higher. So it actually blocks your view of the monitor. In this case, they moved it to a 45 degree angle and you can see the monitor. Also, Nebula claims that this increases the torque of the motor so you can hold a heavier payload. So they say this thing should hold seven pounds or 3.2 kilograms. The battery is supposed to last for eight to 10 hours. It's built into the handle here. And note that the battery is non-removable. It is permanently part of the handle and it can only be charged through a proprietary cable. It's also capable of motion time-lapse. I am gonna have a special episode about the time-lapse functions. It's gonna be a separate video. And there's gonna be a lot of test footage in this review because the gimbal has a lot of different modes, so there's a lot of different things to test. And I also wanted to test a couple different lenses this time. Okay, changing modes. When you first power it on, it starts up in the pan follow mode, so it doesn't follow your tilt, but it does follow your pan. You click this little button under the power button, which is not actually terribly convenient to access. Click it twice and it goes to full follow mode, so it follows your tilt as well as your pan. Click it three times, and it goes to full lock mode. The coolest mode is if you click four times, it follows your roll. So you can do really cool barrel rolls up to 90 degrees, and past then it gets kind of weird. One weird thing about changing modes, which I don't like at all, is in order to get back to the pan follow mode, which is the mode that it starts up in, you have to actually turn the power off and then turn it back on. There's no other way to get back to that mode. This may be a big deal to you, this may be a non-issue. To me, it seems like bad programming. So if you look at this, it seems like the motor could be switched to the right side as well as the left side based on the design, but actually it only works with the motor on the left for some reason. For me, as a Sony user, this is actually great because it means that I can access my battery easily if I need to switch it out. So I'll just show you right now. Like that, boom, switch out the battery. It also means that I can easily access my memory card, which is right here. If the motor was on the right, it would be blocking that. So one thing I really like about this gimbal, which may seem sort of absurdly simple, is the power switch. It's a switch that you flick like this to the right, and then it powers on. I found that even after several days of using this thing, I didn't accidentally switch it off once and it's easy to flick on and off and it responds instantly. With a lot of the other pistol grip gimbals like the Xeon Crane, the Moza Air, the power switch is either too easy to turn on accidentally or it doesn't respond immediately. So sometimes I don't know if the gimbal's on or off and then I'll set it down and then all of a sudden it'll spin around like crazy because the motors are still going. It seems super simple, but if these little things aren't gotten right, then they become major annoyances in the field. The joystick is fine. It's right here. You can manipulate it with your thumb as you're operating the gimbal. One thing I don't like is the handle design itself. If you look at this, this is just solid plastic or metal. There's no rubberization. It's just generally uncomfortable to hold this thing. They do have an optional extended handle that you can buy, but I don't really like that because to me, the main reason to use a pistol grip gimbal in the first place is to have it be readily available at a moment's notice, be able to just pull it out from a backpack and use it. And if I have to assemble another piece on it before I can use it each time, and, and then it becomes too big to put away easily into a backpack or something, then it destroys the mobility factor for me. So what I've done as a crutch is I've taken my tripod spreader legs and I put them on the bottom and I use my second hand to support it with that, which is actually far more comfortable to hold than the main handle. So it doesn't exactly have a quick release plate. It has a tactical cage that you can remove. I don't know what the purpose of this is, but you can take off this whole section and then you can put it back on fairly quickly like this. I think it's supposed to hook into other apparatuses. I'm not sure exactly what the point of the tactical cage is. It also has a sort of quick release where you can slide off the camera this way. So now you've got a plate on the bottom of the camera and a place where it attaches on the gimbal. This is more similar to a traditional quick release, except for when you put it back on, you do have to balance one axis again. Now a word about how you tighten the different axes for balance. These levers latch open and then latch close again 
and they can be kind of difficult to open and close and it can be really difficult to slide the axes back and forth. So for instance, if I, if I want to get this balanced here, let's say I want to get that axis balanced, then I have to slide this lever while the gimbal's upright because otherwise it won't move. Uh, and then I test it. And then if I think it's balanced well enough, let's just say that's okay, then I have to move it back upright and latch it. And actually the upside to that is that the levers seem to never come undone or slip on their own at all. They're pretty secure. Whereas with the knobs that the other gimbals use, I found that those will work themselves loose pretty easily. One more little quibble. The camera plate itself is not 100% toolless. They use a flathead screw here that you have to either screw in with a screwdriver or a coin. And while it may seem really simple, oh, you just bring a coin with you and you can use that any time to tighten it or loosen it. When I'm on a shoot and in the heat of the moment, sometimes I just don't have a coin with me. <laughs> and it's really kind of annoying to have to search around for something to loosen this up or tighten it. I'd much rather them just use something I could tighten by hand and loosen by hand. The gimbal doesn't have a remote, but it does have an app. The app is for iPhone or it's for Mac or PC. I have an Android phone, so I couldn't use the mobile app at all. Instead, I just use my MacBook Pro and the software that you can tune the gimbal with. The software is just the open source, simple BGC software. If you're familiar with gimbals and you're probably familiar with that. The good thing is that you can customize to your heart's content. You can change any setting you want. It's completely open. The bad thing is that you can make a lot of pretty difficult mistakes to rectify if you change the wrong setting. And also there's just a pretty high learning curve to it. It's not a whole lot of fun to use if you're a beginner. And one more weird thing about this gimbal is how you shoot in inverted mode. With most gimbals, you would go into a mode that looks like this to be inverted. And that seems logical. I thought that was the way that this gimbal was gonna be, but actually this is not how the inverted mode works. It's actually like this with the motor in front. So the motor is almost touching your lens. If you're using a lens that's too long, I found the motor actually hits it. And you know, if the camera tilts up too fast, if you have it in full follow mode, uh, even if it doesn't hit the motor, the motor will get in your shot. So yes, it does have an inverted mode, but it is the weirdest, least intuitive inverted mode I've ever seen. So those are my thoughts on the features of the gimbal. Now I'm gonna to go to the test footage where I tested a bunch of different modes and I tested a couple different lenses. This should give you a really good idea of how stable or not stable the Nebula 5100 slant is. Love that will never need to hide Love will always rise above Whatever comes, we will be just fine If I am yours and you are mine Take my hand and let's fly away To another galaxy Hold me close, I want to feel your love Together we are free just be with me Just be with me Just be with me Now we're one with the sun over our heads And at night we'll be the stars We can go any place that we want to I don't care if that's too far Take my hand and let's fly away To another galaxy Hold me close, I want to feel your love Together we are free Just be with me Just be with me Just be with me
I can see birds flying. I see children smiling. When I think about all of the things that you and me could be. Okay, so what do I think overall of the Nebula 5100 slant? Well, when I was using it, it actually felt really good. It felt solid in my hand. It felt like it was smoothing out all the jitters. You know, the operation felt pretty fluid when I was tilting and panning. But when I got back and I reviewed the footage, I saw way too many micro jitters all over the place. This stuff can all be tuned with a simple BGC software, so it's by no means a lost cause. But if you don't want to get into complex PID tuning for the gimbal, then you're going to have to use it the way it comes from the factory. And it just wasn't quite stable enough for me. And you might even just be able to wait for a firmware update that will make it steadier than it is now. So that's what I think of the Nebula 5100 slant. Hope you enjoyed, please subscribe and check out my other reviews, which I am doing uh, the Moza Air and the Zeon Crane version two. All right, see you soon, thanks.